In this episode of The Fun Waste of Time, we're going to talk to the home theater enthusiast who owns this phenomenal theater. Stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of The Fun Waste of Time, where we talk movies, TV shows, video games, and home theater. Now, this is going to be a dedicated home theater experience episode where we talk about our favorite hobbies from the home theater perspective. And I have a fantastic guest joining me this episode who has an awesomely well-designed theater, and we're going to talk details about his space and the things that he's done to get it in the fantastic condition that it's currently in. So let's go ahead and meet our guest. Andrew Bartlett. Andrew, thank you for joining me this episode. It is fantastic having you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I enjoy it. I enjoyed the, the warm welcome and uh, meant to, to somebody. I don't think anybody's given you props on your intro and outro music at this point. So I just wanted to at least give you two thumbs up on that. I love it. So. Hey, I really appreciate that. And I also want to thank you for being patient. It took us a little while to get things up and running with this episode, yeah, but no we're finally all. here. Yep. <laughs> all here. Awesome. So before we get started, Andrew, one of the things that I always like to ask new guests on the show is what are the fun ways that you like to waste your day? Meaning what are your hobbies? Sure. So uh, my wife and I both uh, you know, graduated from uh, University of Alabama and, and are big uh, kind of collegiate sports fans. So football, basketball, um, definitely enjoy uh, kind of keeping up and, and cheering uh, for the for the home team. And then uh, I'm also into you know personal finance and uh you know obviously you know home theater but uh enjoy you know, trying to keep up with our two almost three-year-old uh, little boy as well so. <laughs> that's a lot going on yeah yeah and uh it's it's nice to have your finances in order so when you go to the wife to ask her for more things for your theater <laughs> you know she'll be a little more agreeable right exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> these things are never finished so <laughs> absolutely all right well let's not delay let's get right into home theater experience TV, movies, video games, the ultimate home theater experience, HTX. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to watch a short video of Andrew's theater so we have an idea of what it's like being in the space, and then we'll get into specifics about what it is we've just seen shortly thereafter. So Andrew, if you'd be so kind as to give us a bit of information about what we're seeing here, we would really appreciate it. Sure. So this is kind of the entry space uh, to the theater, a little bar area we have set up for, you know, we're having you know, sports parties and, and people over kind of have a little ice maker and refrigerator uh, here, a little bar for putting snacks and a place to throw away, you know, trash. And one thing I got to ask is, where's the popcorn maker? <laughs> so we, that's actually a different story. We've got a little uh, little stovetop unit upstairs. We keep all the mess in the kitchen so we don't stink up the stink up the downstairs with, <laughs> with grease and oil and so on. But, uh, and this is kind of our, our double door entrance. We've got a kind of a communicating door set up that we'll get into a little bit later and then into the theater, you know, proper. We've got uh, the, the two uh, different rows of seating and then a third bar row you know, towards the back there. And uh, I've got the kind of riser area here going up into the second row. We've got uh, some of the pictures I think have our older couch, but we got the new little red leather uh, kind of set up here just recently. And we've got our you know, kind of pre-wired conduit uh, set up for, um, you know, actuator, seat actuators. And that's what that little uh, kind of piping and cabling is uh, just in the back of the, that front row of seats. Looking kind of around towards the, the bar area, we've got uh, kind of some space to walk around here underneath the projection box. And this is our uh, kind of in the riser built-in subwoofer uh, that's kind of beneath the, the walking surface. Uh, and then kind of looking back towards the, the front of the room, we've got the screen and obviously the acoustic panels kind of around the room in, in various places, but a uh, little lighting soffit that's kind of up you know, around the perimeter and then for kind of a little ceiling glow effect. And then I've got the, again, the projection hush box. We'll kind of get into more of the details here later, but you can see some of the Atmos speakers kind of in the ceiling and some of them are in the, in the front are kind of more difficult to see because they're kind of hidden in between some of the acoustic paneling. And then we've got our, HVAC controller and then the the lighting you know dimmer switches and and so on over here we've still have yet to kind of fully finish out our little 
kind of adjacent game room space here. So we were just kind of using it for some overflow seating storage. And, and we had uh, had that had some panels put up in this room as well. That's one of our uh, HVAC supply, you know, registers there. And then our other one here is up towards the, the front of the room by the screen, kind of by the, our acoustic panels. Nice. We want to remember that because we're going to come back to that later in the episode. Yeah. Absolutely. So our screen screen area here, we also got um, you know, a little bit more to talk about with some of our acoustic treatment choices behind the screen that you can't see there, but we've got, you know, those are actually just for show those little cabinets and, and we've kind of tried to, to utilize some extra bass trapping in that area. And then I've got our dog <laughs> sprawled out on the floor there, but looking back towards the back of the room again. And uh, so everybody in the house wants to enjoy the theater. Look at him having a great oh, yeah. time in there. <laughs> Chilling out. That is fantastic. Yep. But you've done an awesome job with the space, Andrew. I'm really looking forward to getting into more specifics about it. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of into the, in the little game room or what's supposed to be a game room coming up. And then uh, this last little doorway, this actually goes just into a little adjacent mechanical space. We kind of just opted for a very kind of inexpensive way to kind of seal those doors for some of the acoustic reasons that we'll get into. Very but, nice. Uh, and then our little... HVAC uh, return grate was right behind that door as well. So, Really nice. Like I said, that's an awesome job. I'm, I'm really excited to discuss some of this with you. Thank you. Uh, you've done some things that um, I initially was thinking of doing in my theater, but decided to do a little something different. Mm -hmm. But it's really cool to see it in motion with what you have here. So what we're going to do now is get into more specifics of what we've just seen, starting with room dimensions. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to see now is an overview of the space. And Andrew, tell us about the dimensions uh, that you have going on in the room here. Sure. So towards uh, the very front of the room where the screen wall is, it's uh, 16 feet um, drywall to drywall. And that's our finished dimension. Uh, at the very back of the room, we've got up on the back of the riser, we've got 14 feet of width there. Um, and then uh, 31 feet of total room depth. Uh, so from the, from the finished drywall to the finished drywall, 31 feet of depth and a nine foot ceiling. Uh, in the in the tallest portions, that doesn't include the perimeter little lighting soffit. But um, yeah, so again, kind of 16 feet in the width there by the screen, and then 14 feet right toward the back of the back portion of the riser. Um, again, 31 feet, you know, from from drywall to drywall, and then nine foot of ceiling height. So the 31 foot depth is also that goes actually two feet beyond what you can actually see, even where those little lamps are. The, the actual finished drywall space goes two feet behind that, that area. So we've got from the screen material itself to the back of where that drywall is, is four feet. Of and depth. that's where your baffle wall is. We have your speakers and your front stage, your front Correct. sound stage mm -hmm. and everything else exactly. back there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We'll see that here in a moment as well. So let's talk a bit about your screen. Yeah. So we, um, we went with a uh, Sever uh, Severson. I um, hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, material um it's a uh, 16 by 9 aspect ratio which we kind of opted for 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 the variety of content that we watch we considered doing you know a, a full you know cinema scope screen and ultra wide uh versus even like a, a constant image area setup like a 2.0 to 1 screen that we would have variable variable masking for and some different kind of options there but in the end for cost reasons mostly we we kind of opted for for the kind of a standard 16 by 9 screen we, we've been happy with our choice you know, to this point, it's been really good for all the, the things that we watch against sports was was a primary consideration with some of the, the design that we or the design criteria that we kind of put in place for the theater. Um, we also went with a, uh, a high contrast gray material and an ambient light rejecting uh, screen. And, and there's, I guess, a little bit of some uh, some kind of you know considerations when you're looking at, at how to design you know, the, the screen material and what you're hoping to accomplish. And. Again, the, the and what we're going to see here coming up in a minute, which is actually pretty fantastic, even though your screen is fairly low gain, there's a reason why you decided to, to choose that high contrast dark. Exactly. Screen right, material. Right. So it is micro perforated, so that allows for the acoustic transparency. And then again, the dimensions here were 150 inches diagonal on the screen, which is 131 inches wide and then 74 inches tall. And it's about 16 inches. Uh, from the carpet to the bottom of that screen. You know, so it's fairly low, uh, you know, as far as set to the floor, but that was, you know, something that worked well for, for the space and, and sight lines and so on. But so, yeah, the reason we went with uh, kind of a, a lower gain screen is we have kind of a Lumen Monster <laughs> projector, so to speak. <laughs> uh, we, we ended up going with uh, 
a Christie 4K7 HS projector, which is a 7,000 lumen uh, 4K pixel shifting laser projector. Um, it's in a, it's in, it's in, a, in its own insulated hush box, but a little bit of a story behind the projector is that when we were initially kind of specking out the theater and the different equipment choices and and so on, we had had, had initially, um, for cost reasons, looking to use uh, an Epson business uh, class, uh, I think it was like five or 6,000 lumen a projector that was more again more designed for a kind of a business you know environment not a, not a dedicated theater projector with ultra you know low black levels and and so on uh, but we wanted a really bright image and we're targeting you know, in the neighborhood of 30 foot lamberts as far as on the screen you know we wanted it to be kind of like a giant tv for for sports parties and so on and had the ability so to turn that that brightness down some for movie watching not to be you know having to put shades on when you're watching a movie yeah blowing out the color and everything else yeah but, but we ended up you know kind of lucking into this deal. So I had ordered, um, ordered our Epson projector that we were specking initially on Amazon from a kind of random reseller. And, and after three or four weeks went by, you know, still hasn't shipped, still hasn't shipped. And so I you know, contacted the, the reseller and said, hey, what's the deal? And they I said, oh, we shipped it a couple of weeks ago via you know, USPS and USPS lost it. <laughs> Oh, no kidding. <laughs> and so I don't really know who sends a five thousand dollar projector out the door, you know, via you know the the regular you know mail with no tractor <laughs> insurance or anything. So it was a little bit fishy. Ended up going back and forth, and and fortunately it was through Amazon, so they reimbursed us for the full price of it, which is right. good. But the reseller was a little bit kind of fishy. So then we we're kind of back to square one. We're trying to figure out um, you know what we can do to get because this this projection hush box is designed. You know, for a certain um, a certain height, or a certain width, a certain depth of projector. Also, some of the BTU requirements to help keep the projector cool are specific to this this hush box. And and in the in the design phase, we we wanted to make sure to kind of overspec the hush box to to accommodate any potential upgrades in the future. If we were to go to a higher or more you know heat producing projector, we could still keep it cool. And so that was part of the design, which fortunately kind of helped us to to be able to to get into this this particular projector. But during the the uh, exchange with this company that ended up not coming through with the Epson, they're they're more of a business. They they carry lots of different business projectors and and a lot of different manufacturers in that kind of side of things. And so this was one of the projectors that they had. Um, it was just one of the projectors that they could potentially get if they needed to replace our unit. And you know, if they because for whatever, for whatever reason they didn't have any more of the Epsons in stock, so it wasn't an issue. They couldn't ship us another one. They didn't have any more. So this is one of the projectors that they said, hey, maybe we can swap it out for this one, but it's going to be a higher cost and so on. And so I said, you know, forget about it. Um, and so I was actually looking around on eBay one day and there was a guy out in Texas, um, I think in Houston, actually, that um, had had some sort of COVID-19 deal fall through and had two of these these uh, Christie units kind of sitting in his warehouse and was looking to offload them and was able to get, you know, kind of a fraction of MSRP. Nice. You know, this particular projector, which if you look at this model, there's actually a uh, an Optima model. I think it's a ZK750. That's a variant of the same unit, but it's it's actually sold in India under in, in kind of a high end home theater uh, market. So that a lot of these projectors are sold in multiple markets, and this particular one, and not from Christie, but from the Optima brand, is sold in India under under kind of high end home theater um, kind of you know, design, designs and so on. But well, the one thing that I can actually say is in all the home theater circles that I've been in, I know a lot of people own JVCs, Sony's and even Epson's, but I've never really met very many people that actually have Christie's. So yeah. it's really cool that you decided to go with this specific brand. How do you like the image that you get with this projector it's on your, the screen that you have? Yeah, so it's been great. So it, in combination with the screen, which has a really low black flow, that's one of the, the complaints with some of the DLP you know, high lumen projectors is that you know, the, the sharpness is great, but the, the, the contrast ratio and the black floor is kind of lacking, so to speak. And so the, the low grain screen actually helps a lot by lowering the black floor. And we get with the lights off and everything dimmed down, we get really inky blacks and, and really That's nice great. contrast ratio, but still with the ability to kind of crank it up for, for lights on, sports viewing and so on. And that was one of the, the, the things we were looking to do is my wife doesn't like uh, sitting in a dark back cave with the lights off watching, <laughs> watching content. So we wanted to have be able to have some room light on and still have a, a good image. So we're yeah. happy with the, the end result. So. And for those that are watching right now, hang tight until the end of the video, because we're actually going to show some more video, video clips of how Andrew actually likes to use the space. And we actually have some images of, of how the projector looks with a majority of the lights on in the room. I mean, the thing is a light cannon. It's amazing 
how crisp and vibrant the image looks with all of those lights that he actually has on. So hang tight, and we will be getting to that point. Yeah, absolutely. We had uh, actually had uh, Jeff Meyer from AccuCal kind of do a remote calibration to kind of help get it dialed in a little bit, and, and that definitely helped to kind of get it to, to perform, you know, maybe not 100% of what it could be with a professional calibrator in, in the room doing their thing, but I think we're you know, 80%, 90% there and, and certainly happy with the image. Jeff yeah. is oh. a fantastic calibrator. I actually had him here at my home oh, really? uh, a few years back when I first had my theater set up. Mm -hmm. He calibrated my projection system as well as uh, my speakers. Uh, because he does a fantastic job mm -hmm. um, calibrating speakers also. Yeah, I think he's just recently has kind of, with all the COVID stuff, he's kind of stopped doing in-person, in in-home calibration. Yeah, he retired. Yeah, he's kind of retired and doing a little bit of some kind of stuff just via, you know, Zoom and, and over, you know, kind of virtual, you know, calibration that way. So. Yeah, yeah. Still a fantastic guy to have come through and calibrate your system, even if it is remotely, because he yeah. knows what he's doing. He really yeah, does. So, yep. So let's talk about the speakers that you actually have going on in the room. First, before we start, what is the speaker configuration that you have in the room? Meaning, is it a 7.1.4, a 9.1.6? Yeah. Um, tell us about so, that. Yes, yeah, so we've got seven uh, base layer channels, um, four overhead Atmos channels, and then three subwoofers. So, uh, so I guess that's a 7 point. You know, 3.4. Yeah, 7.1 channel, one subwoofer channel right. with three speakers, uh, three subwoofers, and then four Atmos heights. Okay. Yeah, we actually have yeah, one, one LFE channel. We actually have three. My processor has three separate you know, outputs for the subwoofer, so they can be independently EQ'd and aligned with phase and so on, and that kind of you know, helps to, to kind of help integrate things. So. Do you use it that way, or do you just use one channel on all three? I do. So I've got, so my particular processor has the, the kind of newer version of, of Dirac, which is the... Uh, Derek Live base management, uh, which helps. So I think Soundfield management from JBL or from Harman does some of the same things, but it can help to kind of smooth your frequency response over multiple seating positions. So I have a couple different presets, and and it's there's a lot of of math and stuff that goes on behind the scenes, and supercomputers that help run all the algorithms to help do that because there's a million and one different combinations of of phase and delay that you can set for each subwoofer that blend them together to kind of help accomplish the goal of getting. Every seat, like you're saying, a good seat. I know that your your theater is kind of the same way. Where you've got you know lots of different subwoofers help blend it together to kind of help get everyone you know a good experience and not having you know bass bloat in this seat versus you know too low Absolutely. in this seat and so on. So yeah. Okay, well let's get into the speakers that you actually have here. Yeah, so we went uh, in the front. Uh, my front LCR is the the JBL M2 Master Reference Monitor, uh, which we we you know in looking for kind of speakers uh, actually went to Cedia back in 2017, which for anybody who hasn't been, would definitely highly recommend it. You can actually, for basically the price of a plane ticket and, uh, and a hotel or Airbnb, you can kind of get in for free, basically, because there's lots of different, you know, vendors that have free you know, coupon codes, you can kind of, you know, get into the, 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 uh, the expo portion, the, the, the trade show, at least and experience your know, 20 or 30 different home theater setups all in a couple days time. And, and pretty neat to kind of be able to experience that. And I did that in 2016. And if you're just now building a theater and designing your theater, it's a fantastic expo to go to because you're going to come away with a lot of great information and you'll probably change some of the ideas that you may have already had in place based on what you see there. Absolutely. But it's awesome Absolutely. that you actually, and you went uh, the year after me. I went in 2016, you went in 2017. <laughs> yeah, I guess San Diego is where it was in 20, I don't know where it was in 2016. In, but... in 2016, it was actually in Dallas, Texas. I'm in San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. Cool, so right? it was just a, a hop, skip, and a jump from San Antonio here nice. to, uh, to go to it there. But I was working in uh, Kuwait at the time. I oh, had wow. to fly in to the States in Man. order to go to CDF. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. fantastic I think experience. Back in Dallas this year, um, if I remember right. But um, If it is, I'm, I'm definitely going to go because yeah, it's I'm just right sure down the road is, from so. me. Yeah, we may end up going too to kind of just get out and have a, a fun weekend and whatnot to kind of see some, some cool, cool stuff. It's like Candyland for, it um, is. For, for anybody who's into <laughs> home theater. So definitely highly recommended for anybody uh, who's into it. And, and especially people, you know, in the process of building a room or trying to spec out equipment, it definitely helps to, to be able to really experience and, and get a feel for you know, what you like, what you don't like, you know, what size of screen you're looking at. That was one of the takeaways from my you know, kind of experience at CDO was that, you know, the most impactful thing, especially when you're putting speakers and, and hiding the speakers, the most impactful thing to me was, you know, one, having a big giant screen. So that's just, there's no replacement for having a big screen. Even, you know, it's not, you can't look at a cell phone from six inches away and get the same experience that you do from, you know, 150 inch or 160 inch or whatever screen, you know, and, and sitting in the front row kind of thing. And then the other was kind of making sure that the, 
that the system that the system is capable of enough SPL to kind of you know give you the the I'm there feeling and, and help with immersion and so on. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it, back to kind of the, our front sound stage again. We went with the the JBL you know, M2s, which are um, something that's capable of, of high SPL, uh, but also that sounds good at the same time. We didn't want to just put big PA speakers up there and and blast it, and that was never really a a goal. What we wanted it to have clean you know displacement and be able to to kind of keep up with whatever volume we were we were at, but not uh, kind of not be fatiguing and, and, you know, help again to kind of deliver the dynamics of what we're, what we're watching. Um, for our surround speakers, we went with a little bit of an atypical choice, but uh, the, uh, the JBL CBT 50 LA speakers, which are um, uh, kind of a line source design. So it's eight little bitty two inch drivers that are all in a row. And it's um, a little bit, you know, interesting the way that they, uh, their dispersion pattern is very, very wide and very broad. So it covers, you know, a lot of the, the seating area, um, which is nice. It's not, not localizable at all. It's not like a typical, you know, cone and dome, you know, two-way speaker that you just put on the wall where you can tell for sure where the sound's coming from. They're, they're very, you know, broad in their dispersion pattern and really help to kind of blend in and create kind of an immersive sound field, but, uh, but still maintain um, some of the channel separation between uh, the side channels and the overhead channels of the Atmos effects. Now, the one thing that I'm noticing, and we did talk a little bit about this earlier, is you chose not to put your rear surrounds on the back wall, but you chose to put them on the sides right. on the back of the room also. Talk a little bit about that. So we've got so much room depth that if we were to try to put, you know, two speakers way, way on the back wall, it's like something like 15 or 20 feet between our front row main listening position and the back rear speakers. And so there's going to be such a disconnect and, and they're going to have to crank those rear speakers so much that, to get the sound, you know, to the front row that, that it did, just did, didn't make a lot of sense to try to do that. Um, so we actually ended up um, putting, it looks like two side sets of, of, of surround speakers, but the rear set that's up on the riser by that sofa is actually wired, at, they're wired as rears because those speakers have such broad dispersion. They're actually, and it actually kind of aligns pretty well with some of the Dolby specs and the angles uh, that, that when we're sitting in the, in the front row, as we typically do for, for kind of any uh, serious watching, it actually works well for, for immersion and to get the, the sounds in the right place. Fantastic. And this is what the speakers actually look like up close. Yeah. With the grill on and with the grill off. Yep. So, yeah, we've got eight, eight little bitty drivers, which sound, it looks kind of puny. And, and actually, the speakers only weighs like nine or 10 pounds because they're all neodymium magnets. But, um, but it actually is capable of pretty high SPL. I think it'll do 113 dB or something oh, at fantastic. one meter, which is for a, nice. for a surround speaker is pretty you know, pretty high and we don't have to have you know, all that, all that SPL available all the time, but there's several surround speakers that we looked at that weren't going to really quite meet spec for, for reference level listening, even though we don't do that very often. I wanted to be able to at least have, you know, to be able to run demo clips at, at reference volume and not, you know, have blown out tweeters and, and, you know, hurting ears and that kind of thing. So awesome. yeah, we're definitely pleased with the, with the surround speaker choice, even though it's a little bit atypical from what a lot of people, you know, well, it's, a, it's in the, the JBL pro family. I guess I think if I think I've seen these speakers actually installed at like a Best Buy, they're like hanging from the ceiling, kind of pointed in different directions, and and it's kind of interesting some of the the kind of industrial you know installations these speakers get put into. Gotcha. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'm pretty sure they sound awesome. Yeah, they definitely wired wired them up as uh, kind of stereo speakers, just to kind of compare between the M2s and and these, and they they keep up surprisingly well for for their size and and form factor and. Uh, we wanted also something to kind of be able to mount on the wall that wasn't going to stick into the room too much. So some of the other family of speakers that were, you know, the the 708 and 705 uh, speakers, which are kind of, you know, trickle down uh, speakers from the M2 tech are, are a little bit deep and on the wall. They really kind of protrude into the space and create issues with trying to walk around seats and get around smoothly, you know, in and around the room. So these, gotcha. these kind of help with the, it's about six inches deep, you know, total, and they kind of blend in with the panels on the wall as well. So they do. So tell us about the Atmos Heights that you have going on here. And I'm noticing they're a different brand than the JBLs that you have going on throughout the bed layer. They are. So, yeah, they're uh, the Revel uh, C763L, uh, which um, they work really well. That There's, again, two in the front but in the front of the room and then two in the rear of the room. Uh, the rear pair, we had to kind of offset just slightly. There were some issues with our uh, construction techniques and with some of the uh, sound isolation we were doing. There was kind of just an issue with the lighting soffit over in that area and some of the support structures and the, the beams that were overhead behind the drywall that weren't, weren't going to allow the speaker to be in the perfect position. But 
it actually works pretty well. Uh, that, that one that's closest to the hush box is the one that's slightly out of position. We had to move just out of, you know, what spec it is, but it actually works pretty well. And I've, I've tested it and with different, you know, overhead material and pans of, of planes going overhead, you really can't tell at all that there's anything kind of off or, or not quite right there with the Atmos. Of overhead, you got them balanced so. well. That's great. That's yeah. great. So here are the ones in front. Yeah, so we've got the front two that are, are symmetrical place, and those are in the right you know, kind of position from, from, the, from the Dolby spec standpoint, but um, they're kind of buried in, but they're a little bit tricky to see. You have to kind of overexpose the, the image to get a decent shot of, of kind of the speaker itself. It is kind of you know, in between some of the acoustic panels and kind of blending in there. Um, but yeah, again, work, work really well. And after, they do require some EQ to get it kind of blended with, with some of the surrounds and the front speakers, but once everything's kind of dialed in uh, with the EQ, it, it works really well and, and blends really seamlessly. So. Right. And this is what they look like up close without the grills on. Yeah, a little bit of a funky speaker, and there's a couple kind of, you know, knobs you can kind of play with to, to kind of, you know, attenuate the, the sound and different. It's some built-in EQ switches that can kind of get it if you're mounting it in a baffle versus a box versus, you know, like we have in a, an overhead setting. There's different kind of EQ switches. We have everything pretty, pretty much set to standard. But, um, yeah, a little bit of a weird kind of cone, a weird uh, woofer that's a square shape or, or flat panel woofer. But uh, yeah, they, they work really well. They're, they're, the, the biggest thing with these is that they're angled. So um, a lot of the, the overhead speakers that were designed before Atmos was kind of a thing, all kind of fire straight down. Um, but when you have a, a, a driver that's firing the, the high frequency straight into the, to the ground of the carpet, and you're, you're listening pretty far off axis if you're in you know, the main listening seat and those speakers are in front or behind you. So we wanted something with an angled baffle. So that tweeter's angled about 30 degrees, I think, to fire kind of towards the listening position which really helps with a lot of the high frequency the localizability of it and, and so Fantastic. on. So. Now, the one thing that I'm noticing, like we said, they are two different brands. How does the timber match when it comes to the listening of everything at There's one definitely, time? You know, when, it, when it's running frequency sweeps, it's probably the, the most, you know, most you can tell the difference. You can kind of list the, the tweeter when it's running its, its little test pulses is, is definitely has a little bit of a different kind of timber to it. But in, in reuse and after some equalization, Really, really seamless as far as, you know, the, the effects that go from side to overhead and, and so on. So Very nice. we haven't really had any issues with, with timber mismatch or anything like that. So Awesome. Yeah, so subwoofers, we went with um, the, the GSG um, kind of flat pack, the BTS, which is behind the screen uh, uh, kind of line of subwoofers, which are, they basically come shipped to you on a big, you know, 500-pound pallet, uh, which is all kind of raw. You know, this is, in this case, uh, birch plywood. Some of them are MDF, but um, you basically kind of assemble these yourself. So it's, it was one of those things where we're kind of looking at, at different subwoofer options and in order to save a little bit of money, give me a little bit of a weekend project for a couple of weekends to, to get these things assembled was kind of fun to, to do. And um, performance is certainly uh, you know, up there and, and definitely you know, really, really blends well with, with the whole setup and all the rest of the speakers. But uh, we also went with kind of a, a clone uh, GSG sub. Uh, inside the riser itself. So we had uh, actually a, a local car audio company um, kind of design and build a box that had the same, you know, port length, uh, cross-sectional area, and the same tuning as the other um, boxes that were that were from GSG. And, and this, it really blends well. So everything sounds like identical. And, you know, the, the issue with using one of the, the GSG subs inside the riser like we ended up doing was the port direction kind of doesn't match up with with being able to to walk over it we needed a port that fired upwards instead of the opposite direction you know outwards for our, for our front screen subs and so this one has a the port kind of turned there up going up you know into the kind of towards the ceiling basically uh, which kind of helps to to not you know muffle things and so on but it's works really well and yeah really provides some some nice tactile you know feedback for the for the people that are sitting on the back row of the riser so that is awesome so go ahead and take a drink. I know you wanted to, uh, yeah. to butt your throat a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> now, the one thing that I did want to get into was, um, was this cover that you guys actually built for it. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about this? I know this is something that you can actually walk over without damaging uh, the subwoofer itself. Yeah, the, the issue with, with creating a, a riser built-in subwoofer is that that driver has to fire you know, up where people could potentially walk over it. You don't want people stepping in your driver and messing up your, your speakers and subwoofers. So, we actually had my brother as an engineer and was able to design uh, this uh, kind of walking grate, which is made of a pretty inexpensive 836 uh, quarter inch steel. Uh, it's basically a steel plate. And, and we had a local laser shop cut it according to a file that we had created for my brother. And 
and it, some of his modeling software, it, it can withstand like a 750 pound, you know, footstep before it crumbles and an infinite number of like 250 pound, you know, steps on it. So it's basically walking rated. So we don't have to worry about, about damaging anything or bending the grade over time or anything like that. Wow. And, then, and 750 pounds, man. Um, that's, that's getting pretty close to where I am with, with being home the last two years because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> only our, only my biggest friends <laughs> we have to worry about. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but that is awesome. Well, let's give a shout out to your brother real quick for uh, doing this amazing job for you. What's his name? Yeah, Harrison Bartlett. So he actually did did all the design for the the main grate that goes over the driver, and also the the smaller grate that looks kind of like an HVAC grate that goes over the port of the subwoofer. Designed both of those, and then uh, he also actually helped uh, to build the. He actually didn't help. He built <laughs> the uh, the <laughs> protection hush box. So it's we had the the specs for all that uh, kind of from our consultant who helped us design the theater. And he was the one with all the tools and the skill to kind of build it. So he actually, you know, created kind of from the plan, the whole deal and had the plywood and screws and that's hinges and, and everything with it. So definitely a big shout out to Harrison. Harrison, you are a talented and and kind man for helping your brother the way that you did this. That is just fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> couldn't have done it without him. So awesome. So this is, is a photo that you sent to me, and I'm so happy you did because it is the funniest thing. Little man looks like he's just having a great time sitting next to that woofer there. Yeah, so little, little baby. It's about, I think, maybe a year and a half at the time. And, uh, yeah, kind of got the driver shipped in to, to help, you know, kind of create our subwoofers and had to snap a picture with the baby for, for, for size reference. <laughs> the it definitely driver. gives perspective of how large that subwoofer is. That is yeah, awesome. Yeah. It kind of, it's hard to notice without something for, for visual reference, how big these things are, but yeah. it's definitely a big box and a big, and a big driver as well. So. And all of us can relate to this, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Fantastic. You're listening to the, the fun waste of time podcast. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the media rack. So what I wanted to do with the media rack was show um, what it looks like with the door on and then with the door off, and then we'll actually get into the equipment that you have going on within it. Yeah. So where is the the media closet? Is it does it uh, parallel the theater at all? Is it so on either it's side? Not, so it's not on either side of the theater. In between the theater and that little um, space where the bar area and refrigerator, little mini fridge is. It's on the other side of that, so behind okay. the other wall. So there's actually another wall that separates, you know, the, the bar space from this little equipment room. Gotcha, uh, it, okay. it happens to be right next to our electrical panel, which is kind of you know, convenient for, for different outlets and power reasons. But we have uh, kind of two dedicated 20-amp circuits that kind of feed the rack. Uh, and then... Uh, is that a thermostat? Uh, it's on the wall. There's a thermostat actually for the projector box. So our projector ah. box, all the ductwork goes back into this and we have a thermostat cable that goes, it sits inside the box to measure the temperature. And then the actual readout is, is over here in the equipment room. So we can kind of monitor the temperature and set different parameters for humidity and temperature when the fan, when the fan kicks on and speeds and that kind of thing. So fantastic. Great. Okay. So let's talk about the equipment that you have going on in your rack here. Yeah. So we've got, uh, the, you know, the Panasonic, uh, 420 a blu-ray player uh that has the the hdr op optimizer for for dynamic tone mapping uh, to be able to to kind of uh you know play discs at, at 4k resolution and and you know also do some dynamic tone mapping for for the projector to help help get it looking as good as possible it's um you know possible that i may be looking at something that maybe uh you know is, is dear to your heart with the lumens and radiance pro at some point you know soon as maybe a potential next upgrade uh mostly for the dynamic tone mapping and and Fantastic. You know, there's yeah, I know we we don't have the 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 super wide screen like you do, and probably wouldn't wouldn't utilize the nonlinear stretch feature quite as often. But uh, but certainly, we, I don't know. You probably have never noticed this because you have the Lumigen. But uh, with Disney Plus, they recently made a change back in November, where if you have um, a 4K capable device um, that does not su support um, high dynamic range, they automatically downgrade your video to 1080p. And also your audio to 5.1. So even if you're watching something like Loki or WandaVision or whatever that's in that's that's you know created in 4K, you know Dolby Atmos, um, if you don't have the EDID in your system, the, the HDMI EDID, the way that communicates, if it doesn't flag your projector or your your display as being capable of HDR, everything automatically gets downgraded to 1080p and 5.1, which is a little bit frustrating. Every every other streaming service has figured out a way around this with. We don't have this issue with Netflix or with uh, with Amazon Prime Video or anything else, but we are big Marvel fans and do watch a fair amount of Disney Plus content. And so it's it's something that maybe you know the way to get that fixed on our end. If we have 
sent emails to the the Imagineers and and so on, and they don't seem to to uh, you know open to t- to getting things changed for my <laughs> my request. But awesome. And then you got the uh, with the storage unit. Yeah, a little store, a little lockable storage drawer just for little odds and ends, and uh, it helps to kind of keep little little peripheral stuff. Um, and below that, we've got a little kind of ventilated shelf that holds our uh, Lutron Cassetta Pro Smart Bridge, which helps to integrate our our remote control and all the different lighting circuits in the in the room. Uh, the Nvidia Shield, which is, serves as our main kind of streaming box and 4K, uh, you know, kind of, you know, player for all the streaming services. Um, and then the Logitech uh, Pro 24 uh, remote and hub, as we went with uh, the Pro 24, which is t- Pro 2400, which is a, uh, cons- a custom installer version of the, the Harmony Elite, which sadly, uh, I guess Harmony pulled out of the remote market uh, with, with their Logitech series maybe a year or so ago and uh, maybe looking at, at a, when this whenever this thing dies out, I may be looking at other options. I uh, know you've kind of looked into the or you, you've got the the Neo remote, which from Control Four, which I think you've been reasonably pleased with, and maybe like so. we, what we're looking at next. But just a little bit frustrated with the the non user programmable you know kind of interface and making changes and so on. And it's a little bit more burdensome having to go through a, a dealer, basically. Yeah, that's the only thing about having the uh, Control Four is you do have to go through an integrator in order to get things set up for you. Right. But once you have it set up the way that you actually like it, it's rock solid. It works great. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have to call my integrator all that often to make changes. But right. um, typically, most integrators will have some kind of program where you can pay a yearly fee and they can come out and take care of whatever, they, whatever you need mm-hmm. um, in your system without charging you any extra for it. So okay. yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, you'll run into somebody that has that feature within mm-hmm. their program. Yeah, but we, we've been pleased with the Logitech, at least to this point. That's great. Right. Right. Rock, rock solid and works really well. But uh, so, yeah, we went with uh, the Monolith HTP1 processor uh, for, for kind of a 16, 16 channel processor that had uh, Dirac Live, which was something that we were kind of looking to implement with their, um, their base control, uh, base management kind of software that help, really helps to integrate multiple subwoofers, which not a lot of uh, processors can do uh, automatically. So, most, most processors you can, you can manage if you've got someone who's knowledgeable, again, like Jeff Meyer, you know, can come in and calibrate and tune things really well. Um, but if you're just looking to kind of you know, hit, an, hit, hit an easy button and help it to sound and make it sound good, it's really difficult to do that with, with most processors using multiple, you know, three and four or five subwoofers to integrate those properly is not something that, that can be done very easily from an automated standpoint. But, but the Dirac uh, you know, base control feature is one of those that, that really does a good job and pleased with who went, went that route. So I've really enjoyed the processor. But so some of the amplifiers have got kind of a, a rack of, of a lot of crown amps that co- that go with uh, the, with the M2 speakers mostly, but the the top one there is the the crown uh, DCI 4300, which uh, powers the rear and side surrounds. Uh, I've got uh, the other 4300, which powers the four Atmos overheads. Uh, the 41250N, which is a network uh, amplifier, and that that has DSP presets that uh, that make the the M2 speakers sound like they're supposed to. So you can't just plug up any old amplifier to those speakers, they require, a, they don't actually have a, a built-in crossover. They require um, DSP and, and an amplifier that's capable of independently uh, kind of EQing each driver. And then we went with the, the Furman CN2400S, which is a power conditioner, a power sequencer that helps to automate all the pro, pro amps. So we have the trigger out from the HTP1 processor that helps to tell all the other amps to turn on via that, uh, that power conditioner or the power sequencer. Uh, I think we went with the the other Crown uh, two six hundred in that that powers our center channel M two speaker, and then our two our three subwoofers. Uh, the Crest Pro Light three is bridged for our rear uh, riser subwoofer, and then the the Pro Light seven point five from Crest uh, powers our our two front subwoofers. Uh, we also have I didn't it's actually not in this picture, but behind the rack there's actually hidden two uh, mini DSP two by four balanced units that. They actually help with the equalization and some of the high pass filtering uh, for the subwoofers to help not not bottom out the drivers and and help to protect those mostly. Nice. Uh, and then and then finally the uh, the Pro P, Furman PL Pro DMC uh, power conditioner um, helps to power excuse me um, kind of power condition and provide over and under voltage protection for for our gear as well. So. Gotcha. Fantastic. Okay, so let's uh, let's get into some of the dimensions that we have going on with the riser back there. Yeah, so the riser, so uh, we went uh, kind of wall to wall, basically, for our riser. I know your riser is kind of, you know, a little bit of an island in your room. Our, ours is actually kind of wall to wall in the rear section of the room, which is 
something we just decided to do because of the kind of odd shape of our room. We have this weird kind of jut out of our concrete foundation wall that kind of creates this little bit of an of a mini L shape towards the back of the room. And it just made sense to go ahead and just kind of make the whole entire kind of a second story, so to speak, of, of the back of our room. Uh, so at, at the very front of that riser, we have it. It's about 10 feet wide. Uh, it's about, uh, that's right, yeah, 13 feet deep from the very front edge of the riser all the way back to the drywall. Uh, and then it's 14 feet wide in the very back uh, of the room. Um, and it's 15 inches high, which um, kind of helps with our, our build was one that we had to have inspections done because it was a, a totally unfinished basement before we started. Uh, and everything had to be kind of code compliant. So in order to, in order to have you know, a legal step, you need a, a seven inch rise and a 10 inch run. And so to have you know, one step up to a, a legal kind of platform, you need about 15 inches of height. So that kind of worked well. And it also helped to work with the sight lines uh, too for, for the screen. And let me ask you this, because I know that you have a, a 16.9 screen and it sits fairly low. Mm -hmm. The couch that's sitting behind the front row seating can they see the bottom of the 16.9 screen without any obstruction from anyone sitting in front so of yeah, them? Yeah, you, you can't actually see the 16, the bottom of the 16.9 screen. It depends on if we got a tall person or a short person sitting in the front row um, as to whether or not the, the little bit of head kind of going over. Sometimes you have a little bit of, a, of the crown of your head that's kind of in the way. Um, we're te technically, according to all the designs and calculations that were done before we built the whole thing, we're supposed to have a little bitty, little bitty, like four inch miniature riser that's under just the sofa only to help raise it up just a little bit to kind of help with that issue. We haven't really found the need to do it though at this point. And, and we were thinking about maybe, you know, kind of trying it out, seeing how it went and maybe because that little mini riser is just a little bit of a pain to have to yeah, build. Yeah. And so right now we're pretty happy with it as is. So. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why when I built my riser, I decided to uh, take it as high as I thought I could get it without hitting my head at the top of the ceiling. Or I right, should say right. my brother's head. Because yeah. my brother's like six seven, oh, wow. so he still has some, a couple of inches before his head actually hits the ceiling standing on that riser. But um, it can be tricky trying to figure out the right uh, riser height uh, that you should be putting in a room based on your space. But I'm glad that you're happy with the way that you built it and the outcome that you have when people are in the theater watching. Yeah, yeah, we definitely it's worked well for us and and has been again for for most thing if it's a casual kind of sports viewing issue or no one's you know going to be complaining about too much people are moving in and around and getting drinks at the bar and coming back and it's not a, a critical thing to have to see the very very bottom of the screen uh, the other thing with our 15 inch riser height is we're having to, to also consider um, the head clearance for the projector hush box so i think we have about six feet seven inches uh from the from the carpet to the to the bottom of that hush box and if the higher we went on the riser height the less headroom we'd have underneath. Right now, I can, I'm can i 6'3", 6'3", six, 6'4", six, 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 and I can walk under that projection hush box with no no issues, totally comfortable, and not worry about nice. bonking heads or anything like that. So, Fantastic. So let's talk about the seating that you have going on in there. Yes, yeah, so we went with uh, the front row, uh, the uh, the Octane Flex HR seats, which you've been really happy with. They have you know the motorized headrest, which we you know definitely uh, kind of enjoy, and it's nice to have that flexibility, and then also the motorized your reclining feature. Um, we actually just recently installed um, some Croson uh, transducers, which uh, kind of go underneath the seats to help with tactile feedback. And they've been a really nice upgrade with, you know, we're on concrete slab on the first row, whereas the, the second row riser gets a little bit of tactile fee feedback just from the, the subwoofer that's, that's back in the, in the rear of the riser. But the front row really is not getting a whole lot. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to get you know, the concrete to move when you, I don't know, doesn't matter how many subwoofers you've got, you know, this is not going to happen quite like the, the transducers can make it, you know, kind of feel for you. So it's definitely a worthwhile upgrade. Would definitely recommend anyone who's on a concrete slab to consider, you know, either if, if it's a butt kicker or Croson or whatever brand, some sort of a, of a, of a transducer. And yeah, at first it sounds kind of gimmicky and silly. And, and certainly at CD, we were um, kind of looking at, got to try out some of the D box seats, which had the full, full motion and vibration and everything. And we're, I mean, after three minutes, we're like nauseous and getting off the ride and say, no, thanks. We're on to the next booth. But, uh, but, but, but the Croson's, I think, I think actually Croson supplies the transducing actuator for D-Box. But, um, but once these are, once you get them integrated well, it's really, you know, it's really a seamless experience. And, and it really just sounds and feels like you have bigger subwoofers than you have um, with that, with that tactile feedback when it's dialed in properly and time aligned and everything. And that's the key to it is it's not. It's not there for, for the wow factor. And you can certainly shake the sheets and make the, 
the water on your in your cup kind of rattle, but that's not really the goal. It's more just the the immersion that we're after. Which yeah, I actually have some as well, and I have the sound shaker version of it mm -hmm. in my seats, and they're fantastic. I I love the feature. Like you said, it's just enough without being overwhelming, mm -hmm. um, and it, it really gets you more immersed into what it is right. uh, that you're doing, whether it's watching a movie or TV show or even playing a video game. Yeah, because absolutely. to feel the explosions, the gunshots, the yeah. shotgun, um, the shots from whatever game that you're playing, it's just freaking fantastic. I absolutely love it. Yeah, we, we definitely are, are pleased with the upgrade and, and uh, glad we did it. So nice. definitely highly suggested for anyone on a concrete slab, especially, but even even people that are on you know, some sort of a, of a subfloor would be a worthwhile upgrade as well. But uh, for our middle row, I guess we went with just a kind of a more casual, you know, couch option. Uh, the couch that's in this picture is just a, kind of a cheap, throwaway couch from rooms to go that's actually in our little kids playroom area now just so it can get beat up over the years and not have to worry about replacing it uh the, the one that was in some of the other uh, videos was a uh, kind of a red leather uh, chesterfield style sofa which we just got recently but um yeah we we, we enjoy having the the two different seating options it's really nice to have you know kind of a more casual option for sports washing and that tends to be you know people tend to kind of migrate more towards the back of the room when we're watching you know, sporting events and Super Bowls and, and football watching parties, whereas the the front row, you know, is more the the kind of sit down movie movie watching or watching a, a show or something uh, that tends to be more the preferred seating area for those. It's really nice to have the option of both, and uh, and certainly we we watched movies and had you know both both rows filled the the first and second row you know filled um, you know nicely with people and, and had some overflow seating brought in too for the for the first and second row viewing angles that the back row. It, we use the bar actually a lot, not the seats at the bar quite as much, but the bar itself is really nice to kind of throw popcorn back here and Cokes and, and have an area to kind of stash stuff that's not in the way. So Gotcha. And I, I just want to highlight really quick, we talked a little early about the projector being 7,000 lumens and being a light cannon. Pay attention to what's going on in the room right now. He's got the football game going on. All of the lights in the room are on, and that screen is still putting out a beautiful image. That's fantastic. This is just a cell phone shot kind of from the back of the room and there's no doctor. I know a lot of people kind of show pictures of the theater and have, they take a picture with all the lights off and then they superimpose that image onto the screen with the picture of the lights on. <laughs> and they're like, oh, this is, that's not what it looks like. This is just a cell phone shot though, what it really looks like. So it's, it's nice with the combination of a super high lumen projector and the ambient light reducting screen. It's really a nice uh, kind of combination. Yeah, that is fantastic, photos. Andrew. Very nice. So. Let's get into uh, the acoustical treatments that you actually have going on in the room. Yeah, so we worked, um, I guess, with uh, with Acoustic Frontiers to kind of help spec out a lot of the acoustic treatments. Um, but uh, part of the plan for uh, the screen wall was to have, um, you know, we, again, we've got four feet of space from our screen material back to the drywall that's back there at the very, very, you know, front of the room. And so we've got some space to work with. Uh, we want we, That was, you know, partially by design. We wanted to have enough space to be able to trade in and out speakers and subwoofers at some point down the road if we change our mind and wanted to, to upgrade something um and uh, and then it also allows for a lot of different acoustic treatment options uh, we actually went with uh kind of an uh an unfaced r38 fiberglass which is about 12 inches thick uh, we actually have another 12 inches behind that fiberglass to the wall so we've got you know lots of space where you've got the the low frequencies of the of the tower speakers that are wrapping around the speaker bouncing off the wall and coming back and to be able to absorb a lot of that low frequency energy and prevent um, some of the cancellations that happen with with those frequencies really helps to kind of deaden the front of the room and, and keep things uh, kind of uh, contained and, and controlled. We also have a little bit of uh, almost slot diffusers, these, these little wooden panels you can see kind of above uh, the, the tower speakers. Um, there's little little wood slats that kind of create a high frequency limiting effect and they keep the high frequencies from being sucked out of the room and reflect those back to keep things lively and not over over deadened. Um, but uh, but that, that definitely works really well. And then again, we went, you saw in the video earlier, we, we put some of the, that insulation inside of the, uh, the side cabinets that are there too, to kind of help with, with some of the base trapping and, and uh, again, the, the range of the, uh, you know, like low frequency absorption uh, of the front part there, of the room there, so. Went with uh, the Authex Quiet Space absorption panels, which are four inches thick. Uh, for the majority of the front portion of the room, they're two inches thick in the rear riser area just to kind of create a little bit more space to walk around back there. Uh, and then uh, some of the wave diffusers that were uh, kind of from Acoustic Frontiers we work with to help plan out the room. All, all, the, uh, all the panels are kind of placed in areas that kind of are specific to the, the speakers uh, that we ended up choosing and their dispersion patterns. 
Uh, but most people that walk into the room just think it's kind of artwork or something cool on the wall. No one really has, has any idea what they are until they start look, poking at them and touching them and say, hey, what is this? So, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the ceiling treatments, again, are some of the same with uh, the Autex Quiet Space uh, kind of four inch panels and some of the acoustic frontiers wave diffusers. And those middle two larger panels are, uh, are from Acoustics First, is the name of the company, and the oh, Aeolian, I guess is how you say it. That's a, um, that good pronunciation. We're going to roll with it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically a larger version of that wave panel. It kind of works in the same way uh, that it diffuses the sound. And uh, that was mostly for, for kind of budget reasons. So the, the smaller 12 inch, uh, 12 inch by 12 inch uh, wave diffusers um, originally had spec to put another you know, eight panels in this area. But for budget reasons, we actually were able to do these larger panels and kind of save some money that way. And that was nice. certainly a, a consideration with a lot of our build. These, these things can kind of you know, go crazy with the costs if you don't watch what, what you're spending on yeah. this when you're building a room from the ground up. So Absolutely. we're definitely looking for, for kind of ways to save money you know, at every turn. So, but yeah, yes. we're really pleased with the, the result of, of the acoustics. And it's definitely a really, a really nice, comfortable place just to kind of, you know, sit and read a book or something. It's really, really nice to, to not have the, the kind of slap echo and the different kind of uh, acoustics that you may be used to in different, different rooms. But this one's really nice. A pleasant place to be. Yeah, and just to reiterate what we're looking at here, this is actually the ceiling uh, that we're looking at. So correct. Yeah, nice, very nice. Yeah, towards the rear of the room again, we went with the the two inch um, Altex Quiet Space, um, kind of on the back wall there, and then the side walls are Model F uh, scattered diffusers from Acoustic First, uh, which which work work nice. So they actually come in like these larger, you know, two foot by two foot sections, and you, you, we can actually we cut them down. It's almost like a hard plastic, but you can kind of cut it down. And they actually only come in, in white. So if white's not your favorite color, too bad. So we ended up uh, <laughs> kind of painting those with some, some, uh, some spray paint. And it pretty easily is just some flat back black spray paint from Home Depot. Helped make those kind of blend in pretty nicely to the back of the room. So Nice. Very nice. See so our, our kind of little ceiling cloud. You can kind of see you know, what it looks like basically from the, from the rear of the riser there. But it kind of blends in pretty well and, and it's kind of a, a cool little and you almost get this kind of skyline effect you can almost see if you're sitting kind of in the back of the the room where the riser is or, or where the you know couch is you can kind of if you're looking up towards the front of the room the way that the diffusing the fuser lumps and bumps kind of go along with the the little up light uh, from that led uh, tape light you kind of get this little skyline effect which is kind of cool looking towards the front of the room so See so yeah, our, our uh, kind of entrance to the room. We um, you know did did kind of as much sound isolation as we could you know, reasonably do to keep uh, kind of the sound in and also the sound out of the room to help lower our noise floor. And some of the doorways are a little bit uh, kind of different than what a lot of a lot of people just choose kind of one set of door seals and kind of go with it. We actually went with two different sets of doors. So we have you know four four solid core doors total, um, but it's a, a a double door communicating setup where you have you know two back to back doors here. Again, there's one set of doors, which is the main entrance to the theater. And we went with um, kind of a, a, a adjustable door seal that kind of goes all the way around the perimeter and the, and the top of the door. And then an automatic door bottom that help, when, every time the door closes, that, that door bottom kind of pushes down a rubber seal to kind of seal it against the floor. Uh, this is the other set of doors that goes into the mechanical room. And this we used um, a, a set of door seals from PIMCO. Um, I think it's the... S STD or I've, I can't remember the model number, but um, it's, I think it's anyways, it's basically the cheapest set of door seals that we could find for this door to kind of help seal it off completely. And, and it works really well. So uh, there's, yeah, I think we've listed the model number somewhere in the, on one of my uh, kind of build pages, but uh, yeah, it works really well and, and really creates a nice uh, kind of acoustic separation between the outside and the inside of the room. So. Fantastic. So we have um, actually six uh, dedicated zones of lighting for the theater room. So we've got uh, the two lamps up front, which are on their own a little plug-in Lutron cassette of dimmer switches. So these are all um, wired back to the remote control. So we can do everything, kind of turn everything off and on and individually adjust the brightness level of any zone uh, from the remote, which is really nice. But um, the, front, yeah, the front row lamps are on one circuit. We have the, the eight um, kind of soffit lights in the perimeter of the room. That are towards the screen on one circuit, uh, and then we also have the, the little pendant or overhead seat seat lights. We have nine of those over each individual seat, um, and so again, all those are kind of separately dimmable. We have different presets for kind of sports mode versus movie mode, and so on. 
Uh, and then we've got uh, the riser step lights as well that are on their own kind of dedicated zone. And then we've got uh, the eight lights kind of in the soffits towards the rear of the room are also on their own separate zone. So um, really allows for a lot of, like, a lot of customizable um, kind of lighting effects. And we're, we're definitely pleased with the, the lighting you know, scheme we came up with. And that was something that we actually had, uh, had now Niall Malore from Acoustic Frontiers help us with. So he kind of helps helped us with some of the, the, the design for the lighting and help get us different model numbers of lights and everything to kind of you know, make sure it was done right and, and all the you know, all the color temperatures are, are matched for all the different brands and so on. And we're definitely yeah, and you know, it's so funny too, uh, Andrew. I think having different zones of lights in your theater is one of the more important things that you should do as you're designing your theater. Yeah, Because absolutely. you want to use the room for different purposes and being able to configure it in a lot of different ways gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to use the space the way that you and your family wants to. Yeah, absolutely. So very, so, very smart of you to set up as many zones as you did. I did the same in mine. Yeah, so I would also, you know, for anybody kind of considering building or looking at building a theater soon, I would definitely recommend doing kind of a front to back um, kind of design with your different lighting circuits. It's helpful to have kind of lights that are individually dimmable front to back. So, so anytime you have lights on towards the front of the room, even with the ambient light rejecting screen, um, you definitely get some screen washout and so on that it, when you've got lights that are on up towards the front of the room. But when we've got lights on in the back of the room, you know, it's really, you can really watch, you know, whatever you want and, and still have some room light on when you've got that, that separate, separate zones and be able to dial them in separately is definitely, definitely helpful. So. Very good point. Very good point. So we're going to talk about the HVAC that you have going on now. The slide is a little busy. We got a lot going on here. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> a little bit of some, some stuff to decipher, but. Yeah, um, just talk, talk us through what we're seeing here, Andrew. Yeah, so in general, we've got um, kind of a, to, to heat and cool the room, we've got a dedicated unit. Um, it's a, uh, a ducted mini split. So the traditional mini splits that you see in a lot of, you know, European and, and Asian, you know, builds are kind of high up on the wall and they're in the, in the room, you can see them. Um, the, this is kind of a ducted version of that. So it has the same functionality with the way that it can kind of vary its, its fan speeds and the, the compressor and so on to, to provide different levels of heating and cooling, but it's all through traditional ducts. So we have, uh, you know, ducts that go from the unit, uh, one to the front of the screen or above where the screen is, and then another to the game room area. Uh, those ducts are designed to, to, to minimize or limit the amount of uh, velocity that comes out of the duct. So you don't, want to hear the wind of the of the duct fire every time the you know HVAC turns on and starts heating and cooling you don't want to hear that noise so we, we designed it and specified it so that the grates are, are customized to not not allow that velocity to get over I think it's 250 feet per minute um, to, to create any kind of audible noise so and we're pleased with you can turn it on max and turbo mode and and make it really heat or cool pretty quickly and you can't hear a thing even even with the room totally buttoned down and everything which is really nice nice talk about the HVAC that you have going on in the hush box, because I think that's actually really interesting. And a lot of people will want to know what it is you did there. So maybe they can do it in yeah. their own space. Yeah. So um, we have our hush box uh, also kind of ventilated in a separate way where we have a uh, cool air intake uh, and then also a hot air exhaust that comes in and out of that same box. So um, again, it's, it's totally sealed. So the box is, has kind of weather stripping all around the door that, that allows the, the little protectors, your drawer to slide out. That, that door seals up completely, and then we have an airtight uh, kind of transfer of, of air that comes from the, the, the actual intake where the cool air comes to cool the projector off, comes from uh, that little square you can see over in the snack bar area. Do you see the mouse? Uh, yeah, yeah okay. right there is where, where our uh, kind of supply or the cool air comes to cool the projector. It then goes into the equipment room, up into the joist area, and, and over to the projection box. Uh, and then we have, there's, there's a fan that, that pulls all this air through that's, that's located in the equipment room as well. But uh, then the hot air from the, from the projector gets exhausted you know, back to that fan. And that's where the fan is located in the, in the equipment room because we have to have access to it. You can't put those fans you know, up behind drywall. You have to be able to replace it or service it or something happens to it, get to it. Um, so that's where uh, kind of all that happens. And, it, and all, the, the, all this has to be calculated out. So you can't just throw up any fan and any projection box and hope it's going to cool your, your specific projector. You have to know um, some of the BTUs that the projector puts out. You have to know how many CFM uh, that fan has to provide to cool the projector. And it, you have to, once the math's worked out, it's, it's easy, but um, you have to also be able to control when that fan kicks on and kicks off and to know what temperature your, your projector, you don't want to burn up your projector 
and actually talking to Jeff Meyer when he was walking me through the projector calibration, he was like, I can't tell you how many, how many of these things, how many projectors I've seen burn up in these boxes. So be careful with your box. <laughs> so yes, sir. Smart <laughs> but, advice. Uh, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's all, all, all control and I actually leave it on all the time. So there's, there's different ways you can control when that fan comes on and comes off. But my thermostat for the fan project in the projector hush box, um, it just stays on all the time. So it's yeah. never, I don't have to worry that it's going to not turn on at some point. It just stays on all the time, just like a, I know the thermostat in your house and when the temperature gets to a certain level where it's set to, it'll kick on and bring the temperature down. So very smart thing to do. Very well designed. So we're going to talk about design of the room a little bit, go into um, just a bit of what you, what you did when you worked with acoustic frontiers, what was the yeah. experience like working with them? And at what point did you decide to get them involved in your build? Yeah. So we got them involved pretty early when we were kind of thinking about finishing out our basement. We, we kind of reached out to them and, and you know, got a consult and, and kind of ended up working with them, which was a, definitely a, a wise decision on our part and, and ended up working well, you know, with, with some of the, we were using a contractor to do all the finish out of our basement. And a lot of the things that you, know, you need to do for a theater and, and especially with, with sound isolation as one of the goals, it just sounds wacky and, and not standard. And, and most contractors are going to look at you like you're crazy. If you tell them that you want to use two layers of drywall and you want to use these special HVAC equipment that no one's ever heard of and, and do all these weird things with, with these giant you know, power outlets coming to your equipment rack and all this stuff. And so we wanted to have someone on our side that said, hey, this is, this is what we need to do and this is how we need to do it and have all this written out. And so we actually ended up with like a 16-page a super detailed PDF, a document that was kind of our, our build set, our plan set for the theater um, that really helped to kind of you know, be able to show the contractor, hey, this is what we want to have done. And this is why, and, and so on. And this, that was definitely helpful to have that document in place. And actually, you know, one of the things that kind of saved us when we went to, when we had our, our projector, you know, kind of go missing with USPS and have to pick another one was that we had everything already, you know, written out with our projection hush box, the way that the, all the BTU specs of the projector, how much lens shift and, and throw we needed and all those, all those parameters. Because there's only a couple of projectors that we really, really could have chosen from for our particular build. And so it was really nice to have all that in a, in a document. We just went back to it, no problem. You looked it up, look up the specs, and we knew exactly what we had to, had to meet you know, spec-wise to get it replaced correctly. So Fantastic. So now let's get into the build. Yeah, so we, um, again, we did kind of a room inside a room uh, technique for, for some of the, the sound isolation that we ended up doing. Uh, we have, you know, we went with a uh, hat channel and, and, you know, double drywall with clips on the ceiling to kind of help isolate uh, the ceiling, you know, from the rest of the home. And then went with, uh, with double drywall or double, double walls, excuse me, uh, for all the perimeter walls. There's no actual, um, you know, windows that we had to worry about with the room. It's all kind of windowless, which helps so with, uh, with kind of, you know, darkness and, and getting things dark when we need them to be. Uh, but definitely uh, having a lot of these kind of specs. And this is something else that, that uh, Acoustic Frontiers helped with was a lot of the, the sand isolation design and, and how we were addressing each individual wall and, and each, each partition, it was all kind of specced out as well. Uh, again, with the insulation in, in the walls to prevent resonance, uh, some of the soffits that we had to create to kind of help get the, the upstairs HVAC runs kind of you know, isolated away from the theater. It was definitely helpful to have, have a lot of that already kind of specced out. And you can see some of the clip and channel on that one wall, which is actually one of the uh, kind of weight bearing or, or supporting walls of our house we couldn't really move or do anything with that so we had to kind of put clip and channel on that to help isolate the, the sound from getting into or, or out of the, the theater fantastic yeah and then our riser was uh yeah definitely something that was a little bit atypical as well with our subwoofer being kind of in in inside the riser built inside the riser and that actually the subwoofer came first so we actually you know had it built by the car audio company brought it into the space you know put it on the ground and then started building the riser around it uh, with all the wood framing and uh, went with uh, kind of a double uh, thickness decking. Uh, so instead of having one layer of plywood and on the top of our riser, we have two layers separated by a, a roofing felt uh, kind of layer to help prevent squeaks and rattles. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of screws that are kind of holding that in place, uh, but it works. We also filled it with insulation to help prevent resonance. Uh, so anytime you have a, a cavity that, that remains hollow, it can turn into kind of a drum when the, the when the when the bass in the movie starts rocking so you want to kind of help uh, prevent that thing from resonating and creating its own its own sound source by putting insulation in that cavity so that's why you can see all the insulation there filling up the risers 
Very nice. Well, you've done an awesome job with your theater. Andrew, I got to tell okay. you, I'm, I'm very impressed with, with what you did. And it's a beautiful space. And the fact that you have a 7,000 lumen projector has me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, sucker for brightness. So I hear you. Well, you definitely got it toned in just right, man. That, it's a fantastic space that you have there. Thank you. So, Andrew, I want to ask you if people want to follow you and some of the things that you're doing, how can they go about doing so? It's hard. I'm a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Facebook. I don't have Twitter. I don't have Instagram. But you are on, you are on, on ABS. ABS form. I am Let's on talk ABS about ABS. Form. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I do have a build thread there. Um, and uh, B-A-R-T-L-007, I guess, is my username. So you can always you know, shoot me a, a private message or, or look at the build thread and, and reference some of the things there. I'm also, again, with some of the kind of cost-saving measures that we were trying to kind of put forth in the theater, I also have a kind of a separate linked uh, deals thread where all the different kind of deals that I found along the way and, and different equipment choices and so on were kind of, you know, found there. You can always, you know, look at that as well. But right. Uh, right. Yeah. Now, before we close it out, I want to show a few videos of how Andrew likes to use his space. Let's check a few of those out. And we're going to play a bit of the sound just so that you can hear what's going on in the room. But of course, the sound is a hundred times better when you're actually in the room. <laughs> yeah, so just keep that in mind. Yep. And coming up by Marco Wilson and making a play. 485th catch as a Packer. Fantastic. And you just recently held a Super Bowl party, you said. We did, yeah. Had had some friends over and and some kids running around and had had a good time. So I had <laughs> had a lot of people over and had had fun watching the game. Fortunately, it was actually a, a reasonable game, it wasn't a blowout, so that helped uh, kind of maintain keep the it interest and keep it fun. Huh? Yeah, yeah. But uh, the commercials are usually my, my favorite part of that anyway. Even with I know it's mine. Football fan, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm more in tune to the commercials and the halftime show than I am the game most of the time. It's kind of plays second fiddle a lot of times, but. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So let's check out this next uh, video here. A little man watching his shows. It's the big TV in the house. And look, he's sitting quiet watching a show about somebody with ATVs. That is awesome. You got him trained well, uh, Andrew. I got to yeah, tell yeah. you. <laughs> That is fantastic. <laughs> All right, so this last one, we're going to watch a uh, music video that uh, Andrew sent me. And the cool thing about this one is it shows what the space looks like with all of the lights off. So it, it's a really cool video for that reason. Let's check it out. That's a fantastic image, Andrew. I can imagine what it's like sitting in the theater, actually watching yeah, yeah, movies and, and concerts much, and that kind of thing with it. Much improved, yeah, in person, but uh, just get a little bit of an idea of, of kind of what it's like with the lights off. And one of the things with the, the screen choice, the ambient light rejection screen, is that you don't really get nearly as much of the room light up effect. A lot of times with the white screen, if you have a bright image on screen, that white screen reflects the light into the room, really lights up the ceiling and the floor and the walls. And that's one thing that, that sometimes people don't think about quite as much with some of the ambient light rejecting screens is that you don't get all that, that light washing out the image quite as much because the because of the ambient light rejecting properties of the screen. So that's one thing that we found that's been really nice. We don't really see much of our of our of the ceiling or the floor kind of you know, washing out with light and, and which gets reflected back onto the screen to wash out the picture. So um I definitely enjoyed enjoyed that aspect of things. Absolutely. Like I said, it's extremely well designed. I want to thank you for contacting me and sharing your your fantastic theater with us. Yeah. Because absolutely. you did some really awesome things with it. And I think a lot of folks are really going to learn from some of the things that you've done you've done uh in the build of their own theater. Yeah, thanks. So, so one other really thing on that, on that last demo clip, um, that's actually my wife's favorite demo clip of all the different things that we show on, on the screen. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's called Semantics. Um, so I think it's C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S or Somatics. Um, Somatics, by, yeah. By Nigel Stanford. You can actually pay. It's like if you go to like nigelstanford.com, I don't have any financial relationship with them, but 
uh it's like eight bucks you can get like the full 4k um, video you can download it on a hard drive or usb stick or whatever and kind of play it back in the theater and it's pretty pretty neat if you watch the foot it's like a five minute video but it's pretty neat uh kind of demo clip if you've never watched it before so that's awesome so guys if you want to keep up with what andrew's doing go to avs forum once again andrew what was the the uh username, the username profile is, name? uh bart l007 b-a-r-t-l-007 reach out to him follow him he's done some fantastic things andrew once again thank you so much it's was a pleasure having you on, and I learned a lot myself. So I really appreciate Absolutely. you taking the time to show what you share. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, all right. I want to thank you all for watching and listening into this episode. If you enjoyed what you heard here today and what you experienced, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We'd love for you to join in with us the next time. Tell your family, tell your friends. We want as many people to join in on the fun as possible. Be sure to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platforms so more people can find out what the Fun Waste of Time is all about. And if you're interested in some of the latest things that are happening within the Fun Waste of Time community, follow us on our website, thefunwasteoftime.com, Facebook, and Instagram. If you'd like to reach out to ask a question or share your thoughts on a particular subject, or just give us a shout, shoot us an email at podcast at thefunwasteoftime.com. That's podcast at thefunwasteoftime.com. Well, y'all take care, and y'all come back now. You hear? <laughs>